countdown has been going smoothly overnight. We have not been working any technical issues since the tanking began at 11.09 last night. Loading the space shuttle external tank with the 525,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen was concluded at 2.05 this morning. Once again, all our countdown events are proceeding normally, leading to an opening of the launch window at 8.06. We're cautiously optimistic about the weather. We're uh, now at the uh, astronaut quarters in the operations and checkout building at the Kennedy Space Center, where the STS-59 cake is in the center of the table. Mission specialist uh, Linda Godwin down uh, at the end of the table. And uh, sitting next to her mission, uh, Specialist Jay Apt. Linda Godwin and uh, Jay Apt working on the Space Radar Laboratory during the flight. And uh, next to Jay Apt is Mission Specialist Tom Jones, who will also be flying on the Space Shuttle once again in August on the next Space Radar, radar Laboratory mission, SRL-2 again on Endeavour. Our uh, pilot Kevin Shilton and uh, sitting next to him is our commander Sid uh, Gutierrez and uh, then on the far end is mission specialist Rich Clifford. This is shuttle launch control at T minus three hours and counting. The countdown uh, has picked up once again for the launch of STS-59 and Endeavour. And all of our activities are on schedule this morning. We're cautiously optimistic about the weather. The uh, broken layer at the shuttle landing facility is expected to go scattered sometime after sunrise. So we're still uh, hopeful that if the wind uh, does not become any stronger than it is currently, that we will have a launch this morning. Among the uh, tools that the ICE team is using is the uh, portable infrared scanner. That's uh, the most important device which obtains temperature measurements on the surface of the uh, vehicle and uh, it can also spot uh, any leaks. And they're looking for any uh, ice which uh, could be on the tank or uh, other areas of the uh, fixed service structure which uh, could at launch could break off and strike the orbiter. This is shuttle launch control at T minus three hours and holding. Our uh, commander, Sid Gutierrez, outfitted there with his uh, communications hood. And the uh, final fit check of the helmet. And our pilot, Kevin Chilton. He uh, flew previously on the STS-49 mission. And he's ready to go this morning. And there's our uh, payload commander, Linda Godwin. And mission specialist, Rich Clifford. Jones, mission specialist, who will be flying again on Endeavour in August on SRL-2.
astronaut uh, Dave Liesma there talking uh, with Jay Apt. This is shuttle launch control at T minus two hours, 51 minutes and counting. Our commander Sid uh, Gutierrez, followed by mission specialist Tom Jones, as Jay Apt, Linda Godwin, Rich Clifford, Dave Liesma, and Hoot uh, Gibson also riding down the elevator. He'll be flying the shuttle training aircraft this morning and the, uh, the T-38 for weather reconnaissance. Mike Stevens from uh, NASA Security, leading the crew as they come out. southeast at about 10 to 15 knots. Aboard uh, Endeavour helping the crew again today is astronaut Andy Thomas. He's been in the uh, crew compartment uh, configuring the uh, switches, making any changes necessary uh, to the compartment and will be assisting the astronauts as they board. seconds standing by for the handoff to Endeavour's onboard computers in about 10 seconds at T minus 31. TLS is go for auto sequence start. Endeavour's computer is now controlling. Suppression water system being activated. Seven, six, main engine start. Five, four, three, two, one, 
zero and lift off of the space shuttle endeavor observing the changes of planet earth speed now 1,000 miles an hour, five miles downrange. Endeavor, go with throttle up. Roger, go with throttle up. Altitude nine miles. Three engines now back at full throttle. One and a half minutes since launch, Endeavor's already burned more than two and a quarter million pounds of propellant and weighs less than half of what it did at liftoff. Altitude now 15 miles, speed 2,100 miles an hour, 15 miles east of the launch pad. Flight controller standing by for burnout and jettison of the twin solid rockets. Good solid rocket booster separation confirmed. Endeavour now 33 miles northeast of the launch pad, altitude 30 miles, speed 2,700 miles an hour. Endeavour, performance nominal. Ignition. Lift off confirmed. Copy. Roll up for Houston. Roger roll, Endeavor. Flight guidance, see the roll. Copy. Throttle up, three at 104. Endeavor, go with throttle up. Roger, go with throttle up. Endeavor, Houston, we see a nominal MECO, ohms one not required. You have a go for the ET photo DTO. Roger, that's a work. Right, Capcom. Go ahead, Capcom. I'd like to uh, get the AOS and LOS times for Diego worked up to add to the spiel I'll give them for uh, LOS and AOS from the east and the west. Roger, we're checking. Flight GMT.
plastic than it does to the rubber. That sounds like another PhD subject. See, this shows I'm great on the TV. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any doubt? <laughs> Same thing. Got a good picture, Rich. Okay, Bill, what you're seeing is some uh, live cells uh, growing in the space tissue loss B experiment. S STLB, along with its companion, STLA, are growing live cells in the microgravity environment to evaluate the effects of microgravity on the growth process. And uh, the novelty of STLB is it's making its maiden flight to check out a new video microscope system which is going to allow real-time monitoring of the cell growth process in microgravity. To check out the system, fish eggs are being used to watch the development of the embryo during early division stages. This is going to evaluate if changes in gravitational force have an effect on cell movement in three dimensions. Experiments like this should provide unique insights on the effects of physical forces on cell movement and may provide clues to the understanding of how wounds and organs develop. Okay, Nancy, we'll turn it over to Sid. Gutierrez, commander of this SRL mission, and uh, this morning I'm going to try to do uh, my most difficult task of the entire mission, and that is to uh, attempt to explain zero Doppler steering. During the course of this mission, we've been uh, initiating approximately 460 maneuvers. In fact, this morning, we just initiated the 262nd of over 460 maneuvers. By the time we finish this flight, we will have initiated more maneuvers than any other shuttle mission. These maneuvers are very important because they help us point our radar in a very special way. In our normal attitude, we fly around the Earth with either our nose forward or our tail forward with the payload bay radar pointed at selected sites. We produce a radar image by sending a radar signal, which is bounced off the Earth, and return to an antenna in the payload bay. Scientists use very powerful computers and very complex software to process this radar data in a very special way to produce what we call a synthetic aperture radar image. In fact, just this morning, they transmitted up to us on our TIPS machine a picture of a radar image that was taken of the Galapagos Islands was taken to the Galapagos Islands just yesterday. Probably hard to see this on the uh, on the television image, but uh, this was created with the radar image. This very complex processing assumes 
that the orbiter is parallel to its ground track as it travels around the Earth. You can see that for an Earth that does not rotate, an Earth that's perfectly still, this is probably true. But we all know that our Earth rotates. So as the orbiter goes around the Earth and the Earth rotates, that means that our ground track and the orbiter are not perfectly aligned. And I've exaggerated this a little bit for demonstration purposes. We can make them aligned by constantly maneuvering at just a fraction of a degree per minute so that as we fly around the Earth and as the Earth rotates underneath us, our orbiter is always aligned with the ground track that we trace across the ground, which is what is really important for the radar. We call this zero Doppler steering. And this is uh, one of the types of consumables that sometimes can limit flight duration. Uh, we, of course, have plenty stored for our mission. And uh, they're very large filters that fit in, that are inside uh, some protective covering that we have to remove before we put them down into the air purification system. And this, this is uh, done at the end of each of our shifts, the red shift and the blue shift. So we swap out uh, sometimes one and sometimes two cans uh, twice a day. And as this is removed, we very carefully uh, save the, uh, the tape we're peeling off um, and the covering, and we put the used cans back in that um, and store them back in the same area. And sometimes we know that we can come back and get some of those out again if for some reason we need some additional purification capability.
Hi, I'm Sid Gutierrez, Commander of the Space Shuttle Endeavor. This message was recorded in April as we were orbiting the planet, studying the surface of the Earth and the atmosphere above it. As we image the surface of the Earth with our radar and visual photography, we've noticed certain rectangular patterns all over the world. More and more of these patterns are appearing in the United States. On closer examination, we realize that these are soccer fields. More people are playing soccer than any other sport. And for the first time in history, the World Cup is being held in the United States. So from way up here to all the participating countries back on Earth, welcome to World Cup. Good luck, but watch out. We're even working on a team up here. <laughs> oh! oh! <laughs> Rich! You let it in! Score! <laughs> More head bouncing? Yeah, a little more bouncy off. <laughs> <laughs> How about elbows? <laughs> Come back down. Remember, it's going to always ricochet off something. It's going to close volume. W5RRR, this is N5REX. I'm receiving you loud and clear. Yeah. You know, it's exciting and all to be up here in the shuttle. There's no denying it. And uh, the views are just <coughs> beautiful. But uh, the thing that really makes you feel good is to know that all those people that uh, worked so hard, so long to make this work, uh, are coming together for them. That really makes you know, brings a tear to your eye. It feels like such a happy feeling, isn't it? Good morning to everyone uh, back there on the uh, central time zone. Uh, I'm Tom Jones, uh, mission specialist aboard the Space Shuttle Endeavor. Uh, we're now over the uh, South uh, Pacific Ocean, just uh, southeast of New Zealand. I want to take a few minutes uh, out of our busy schedule up here of maneuvers and uh, science uh, operations to uh, tell you about our studies of global change on this mission. This mission of the Space Radar Lab aboard STS-59 on Endeavor is part of NASA's uh, mission to planet Earth which is a comprehensive program using uh, the space shuttle and unmanned satellites to study the Earth uh, as the next century begins and to understand the changes that are going on, both natural and man-made. Now, I'd like to tell you um, about our experiences here for the first four days of the flight. We've been seeing uh, traces of both man-made and natural change. Spring is coming to the northern hemisphere. We can see the snow line uh, retreating across Asia, and we're 
seeing vegetation patterns, uh, land use changes, uh, natural changes caused by weather and uh, geology, like volcanoes and earthquakes. We're looking for all those kinds of phenomena. I'd like to tell you about why we're able to study global change from the space shuttle on this flight. First of all, I want to mention our vantage point up here in orbit uh, above the Earth, what the Space Radar Lab out in the payload bay is looking for, and then give you some examples of the kinds of change that we're hoping to study on the flight. Now, our vantage point here aboard Endeavour is very important. We're about 138 nautical miles above the Earth's surface, circling the glo globe once about every 89 minutes. And that elevation, that altitude, gives us a horizon that's out several hundred miles from uh, wherever we happen to be over the Earth. And that gives us the broad perspective and the ability for our sensors in the cargo bay to see a long distance and measure change in a uh, reasonably efficient amount of time. Uh, also, because we're in orbit, our speed is very important. Circling the Earth at 17,000 miles an hour, we're able to use our speed to let our radar out in the cargo bay, Circe XR, uh, create a much larger electronic antenna than would otherwise be possible. We can see finer detail on the ground because of our speed across the Earth's surface. That whole technique is called synthetic aperture radar. And also, with our pollution sensor called MAPS in the cargo bay, our speed permits us to cover the world as it rotates beneath us, and thus we can create in just two or three days a global map of carbon monoxide, a tracer gas of pollution or burning on the planet's surface. So the vantage point here is very important. Now, what kinds of changes can we see from this vantage point in low Earth orbit? Our synthetic aperture radar creates images, pictures of the ground using microwaves, which can be taken during darkness or through clouds. The MAPS carbon monoxide sensor creates a map of global pollution. It traces sources of combustion and how that uh, trace uh, gas CO spreads across the globe. Now using those images and that pollution map, we can look at Earth's past, present, and its future. We can look back into Earth's past by noting changes in the geology of the Earth that tell us about the world's past climate. We can look at the present and take a snapshot, a baseline measurement, if you will, of the pulse of Earth's forests, cities, uh, our production of pollution uh, in both hemispheres, and we can also measure the ecology, the environment, and take its present temperature, if you will. And now we can look into Earth's future by flying the Space Radar Lab twice this uh, year on STS-68 later in the year, and later a radar of this type and a similar suite of instruments could be orbited on an unmanned platform. And by measuring Earth's environment over months and years, we can see the trends on our uh, ecosphere that would help us manage the planet in a, in a better and more careful way. Okay, Nancy, uh, what we did was earlier today we recorded us doing uh, what we're here for, which is to do a large number of maneuvers to point the radar exactly at the targets that the radar folks are interested in. And we understand from uh, the radar people that they're getting uh, accuracies that are far beyond their uh, initial expectations, and the targets are showing up right in the middle of their radar swaths, and we're real happy uh, to be able to help them do that. Here we are putting in uh, one of the 460-some maneuvers that uh, the ground has planned for us, uh, and uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be able to go do that uh, and see the results like the radar folks have been showing people down there and know that we're able to point the orbiter uh, extremely precisely to get very specific targets within range of uh, the radar beams from the, from uh, all of the equipment out in the payload bay. This is what uh, we spend most of our time doing, and uh, what I think uh, you guys have been really helping uh, us check. We're just now coming upon Chile uh, after passing uh, across the coastline. And the target area for this observation is the uh, Andes Mountains, Central Cordillera area. Dr. Isaacs uh, is mapping the topography and studying the climate in the Central Andes Mountains. He's mapping uh, things such as plate tectonics or the movement of the Earth's crust in this area, as well as mudslides, 
and other uh, climatic events. This image is of Sicily. Uh, this is a real-time image seen exactly as the radar system aboard Endeavour records it. And now Endeavour's uh, radar is crossing the coast of Italy. This is the most southern tip of Italy here. The uh, Matera Italy calibration site is located in a very flat agricultural area. And the wavy lines in the image are the uh, former Yugoslavia territory, uh, Eastern Europe. Well, this is uh, a view from one of the off-payload bay cameras uh, showing the radar and zooming out from the cockpit uh, over to the Earth. This is on a pass we did earlier today uh, over Central Europe. You can see the KU band antenna uh, lit up there. And that's how a lot of the data that you're seeing real time uh, down on Earth gets down there. Okay, Jody, we're over. Uh, we're getting uh, close to the water here in the Labrador Sea. Okay, we're. Well, it looks pretty clear today. Great, we're all listening. We're seeing some clear areas out there and uh, some sea ice, and there's some sun glare chasing just ahead of us. Uh, and the sea ice, the chilies are trying to shoot right now. Okay, we're seeing the XR come down and uh, see the ice looking as large flows that are breaking up. That's exactly right. Uh, there's some very large sections and then kind of wavy looking pieces uh, where we can see clear water in between. We see those right now. The leads are showing up quite clearly. We have a video uh, that we'll show you next, which is a view of the Earth along the, uh, across Canada, and you'll see both the Earth as viewed by the astronauts through a video downlink, and the Earth as viewed by the radar. And this is coming across the screen now. You see the white areas on the right are frozen lakes. In the radar image, they appear black, and the bright areas in the radar image on the left are forests. <clears throat> this is a time of year when thawing is occurring, and in the early part of the mission, the astronauts were calling down that all of these lakes appeared nearly uh, completely frozen, and now today they're calling down that uh, some of the ice is starting to break up, and so we're pretty excited about this. This means that we might capture the thaw uh, in these high boreal forest regions. This is a real-time image coming down from the uh, synthetic aperture radar. The uh, site that uh, is currently being tracked. is of uh, the Netherlands region of uh, Flavoland. The uh, orbiters again moving uh, to the southeast. This is a calibration site uh, of high interest uh, primarily because of its uh, it was artificially created by the Dutch, and uh, it allows uh, for easy interpretation of the radar data once it's obtained here on the ground. These are the German Alps uh, showing up now on the radar. Uh, now we're approaching the super site at uh, Oberpfaffenhofen, Germany, where the uh, 24 locations with their active radar calibrators are set up. And the Munich airport passing uh, right below. Oberpfaffenhofen is just outside Munich. And the Danube River now in the picture. 
before sunrise on the California coast, but the uh, radar can see through that as the California coastline comes into view. On a northeasterly track, uh, Endeavour uh, will cross, well, cross the coastal ranges, uh, which are mountains that are made from uh, various fault lines. Should also cross over the uh, San Andreas Fault just before the San Joaquin Valley, uh, which is uh, coming into view, a large agricultural area. Uh, the orbiter is now uh, crossing the Sierra Nevada uh, to the Mammoth Mountain uh, area, which is a backup super site, which is on the eastern part of the Sierras. As I mentioned, this is a hydrology site. The interest here is uh, for the snow cover and the amount of snow cover uh, at in that area because of the uh, uh, production of water that the Sierras produce for the Southern California area. What you're going to see in a minute is a Circe L-band image of Death Valley. Death Valley is one of what we call our super sites. Uh, in front of you, you can see the Long Valley, which is the dark area at the, at the center of the image. And on either side, you can see the high ranges. Now, a lot of you may be familiar. We produced some similar uh, videos uh, for the Magellan mission. We start out here in the Cotton Ball Basin. The bright, rough surfaces that you see are salt deposits along the bottom of the valley. Uh, and also some of the rougher, rockier surface surfaces. Now, this is L-band, which means that the bright surfaces you, that you see are produced by sort of uh, rubble-sized or medium-sized blocks. Now we're flying down through Death Valley. The smooth deposits you're seeing are, are some of the uh, relatively smooth salt deposits on the floor and some of the smoother fans. Now, these fans that are coming down from the sides of the valley are produced by uh, much wetter periods in history. What we're trying to understand here at Death Valley with this radar data is what can these alluvial fans tell us about the past climate history of the Earth? And the coastline uh, coming into view, uh, vision from the uh, synthetic aperture radar as uh, Endeavour crosses the coastline of North America up uh, just above uh, the state of Washington. The data take is of the uh, Juan de Fuca Strait, which is off the coastline. And uh, this is an oceanographic data take for the radar system. Again, des designed to uh, observe surface and internal waves as, uh, as well as uh, wind motion at the sea surface.
right. Now, this, uh, this short clip here is uh, far northeastern Asia uh, on the mainland passing out to sea. And you can see on the um, video here the coastline of Sakhalin Island, and it's very snowy still in this part of the world uh, as winter ends. And there is some sea ice all along the uh, uh, island of Sakhalin up through the Sea of Akats. It, uh, the radar is imaging for um, uh, experiments on the penetration of the radar into the ice field. And you can see uh, frozen lakes and ponds in the tundra region up here. And uh, in particular, one of the calibration sites for the radar mission to uh, evaluate the performance of the radar beam, its strength and uh, signal intensity, and, its, uh, and the ability to aim the radar accurately is Sarabetsu, Japan. And that calibration site is coming into view right here. You can see some of the snow-capped uh, peaks around this uh, area of the coast, and then the uh, street pattern there just to the northeast of Sarabetsu on the coast of uh, uh, Hokkaido. And there you see us uh, passing out over the um, east coast of Hokkaido into the Pacific Ocean. It's uh, a site that's of uh, a lot of interest to a lot of people because this is an uh, area of the Aral Sea that used to be the fourth largest body of water in the world and is now shrinking tremendously due to taking the water for agricultural irrigation of the cotton fields down in Kazakhstan. And, in fact, the area just uh, to the top of your screen there, I'm sorry, to the bottom of your screen, uh, has a uh, number of fishing boats that are left high and dry 30 or 40 miles from the water. It used to be an enormous uh, commercial fishing area, but now it's, uh, it's drying up, and there are predictions that uh, if things continue at the current uh, rate of diverting the water, the whole Aral Sea will be uh, dry by the year 2020. This is Mission Control. These uh, views are from Endeavour's payload bay cameras as it uh, flies down across the southern Pacific Ocean on this uh, orbit. It will pass just uh, slightly north of the uh, tip of New Zealand. Endeavour is uh, on a southeasterly track now uh, out over the Atlantic Ocean just after crossing over the uh, coastline of the east coast of the United States. The orbiter is in a nose forward uh, position with the payload bay of the orbiter pointed toward Earth. Endeavour Houston, we're live on the flight deck. Endeavour Houston, uh, New York City sure was impressive. We're enjoying it too, Colonel Mack. Yeah, Bill, we just got a beautiful pass up the Hudson River in uh, South West Point. Yeah, Rich, I'm trying to uh, tell Brent he should have gotten here just a couple of minutes ago and maybe uh, seen that other school further down the coast. You have a SRL, no response, but your goal for tape change on recorder three.
Yep. I was able to hot wire around that night. <laughs> so does anybody have any spare cell towers? Yeah, I do. But you're not, you're not going to use time? Yeah, I have a surplus. Okay, I like that. What a deal. See, I didn't get to see this last time. That's true. Daylight entry. It felt smooth to me. <laughs> Houston Endeavor, we'll stop. Endeavor is about to uh, get onto the heading alignment circle and will begin executing a 285 degree left overhead turn to align the vehicle for a landing on Edwards Runway 22. At about 57,000 feet. Traveling at 875 miles an hour, descending at about 300 feet per second. Now below 30,000 feet, 530 miles an hour. Endeavor on energy at the 180. Copy on energy at the 180. Endeavor, you're on glide slope on center line, surface wind 3602 peak 4. Roger, we'll stop, Endeavor. Sid, your radar laboratory has provided an unprecedented view of our planet, and you and your crew have been a joy to work with. Welcome home. Thanks. Glide slope in center line? Yes, sir. Okay. 
Endeavour, you're on glide slope on center line, surface wind 360, 2 feet 4. Roger. Copy. 